here and now. Flipping the switch, the province moves to split up Nalcor. The housing market overall is very stable. And if you're a first time buyer, the province has money for you. Caught clues up tonight. Will there be a second season? We're working on it, but uh, there's no official green light, but there's definitely a plan. Boy, oh boy, a terrific Tuesday shaping up across the province. Lots of sunshine. I'll let you know how warm it's going to get coming up. Our top story tonight, there's a shakeup coming for Nalcor and some relief for taxpayers. Tuesday is budget day in this province and some of the details are already filtering out. Here now, Terry Roberts joins us live from our newsroom. So Terry, first of all, what's happening with Nalcor? Yeah, Carolyn, well, we all know that uh, Nalcor Energy was created just over a decade ago by former Tory Premier Danny Williams. He made this uh, uh, entity to manage the province's energy resources. Well, now it looks like Nalcor will soon be managing one less line of business. Sources are telling us the Liberals plan to separate the oil and gas division from Nalcor, effectively creating a standalone entity for this profitable operation. There's the possibility of creating a publicly traded oil and gas company with a combination of government ownership and public stock perhaps similar to Stat Oil in Norway. Now, right now, Nalcor Oil & Gas is an equity partner in three offshore projects and took in over $65 million in profits over a recent nine-month period. It's all part of a strategy to significantly grow the oil and gas industry, but government refused to confirm the move today. So what's your plan for, for Nalcor? Are you <laughs> separating the oil and gas division? I think what you're, uh, off, you're asking is, uh, you know, whether or not uh, there will be something in the budget tomorrow. I guess tomorrow will be a budget day. Now, sources are telling us that uh, breaking oil and gas off from Nalcor uh, will also give the, uh, that division some distance from the uh, financially disastrous Muskrat Falls project, which of course is years behind schedule and uh, billions over budget. Now, I also asked Siobhan Cody today if the province plans to sell any of its equity stakes in any of these offshore oil projects in order to generate an infusion of cash. She said it's not on the agenda today. Okay, interesting. So uh, what else can we expect in Tuesday's budget? Uh, yeah, Carolyn, well, look, well, there's no hiding the fact that this province is on very shaky, shaky financial footing. But we're being told Tuesday's budget will not be as bad as some might expect. Uh, we already know there's not going to be any mass layoffs, of course, due to the contract negotiations we've already heard about. Well, now we're hearing that there might just be some relief for taxpayers. Now, you remember that controversial decision in 2016 to implement a 15% tax on insurance. Well, we don't know all the details, but expect some changes on that front and perhaps in a positive light. And if you're a business owner, you may also be getting a reprieve on payroll taxes. So uh, in general, really, you know, we're expecting a steady as she goes uh, financial blueprint from Tom Osborne, who will be delivering his first budget since becoming this province's finance minister eight months ago. Reporting live from the newsroom, I'm Terry Roberts for Here and Now. Workers at the Iron Ore Company of Canada plan to continue voting tonight on the company's final offer. And if workers agree with their union, that vote will be no. Steelworkers local president Ron Thomas is recommending workers reject the offer. And if they do, that could trigger job action. 99.6% of workers voted in favor of a strike mandate earlier this month. Talks between IOC and the United Steelworkers broke down when the company hoped to introduce a two-tiered pension system in which new employees would get one-third of the pension value. The company also wants to change how sick leave is managed. This is some of what IOC says it's offering, an average 2.4% wage increase every year for five years of the agreement, increased contributions to the defined contribution part of the pension plan, reduce the number of temporary workers from 12.5 to 6% of the workforce, but continue to use them. Workers will be voting on the new offer until midnight tonight. 
A St. John's woman says the military mishandled her case after she reported that she had been sexually assaulted by two of her fellow reservists. Courtney Dunn says the assault happened after she agreed to, to go to a party at a St. John's hotel room. The Department of National Defense says she did make a complaint in 2012, but says it didn't investigate the incident because it happened off base. The first incident was rape. I was 16 years old and I was raped in the military by two guys at the same time. The military handled the situation completely inappropriately. Um, after I had reported that I was assaulted, the guy, one of the guys actually was on my course and he slept across the hall from me, not even 10 feet away from my bed for two weeks after it happened until I was medically released from the course. What was it like having him there? Terrifying, I didn't sleep. I still have nightmares about it. I, I have been diagnosed with PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress, stress disorder. Has anyone ever been charged? No, I have. So when you say you have, how do you, what do you mean? Um, for the night that I was raped, I actually uh, ended up getting charged because I had told the Padre that I had drank underage. So because I had been given an order not to drink underage, and I did anyways, I was charged with disobeying a lawful command by a superior officer. It's definitely created long-term negative impacts on my life because there was, there's days I can't get out of bed because I'm just reliving everything and my body feels so heavy and I feel like I'm being crushed and all I wanna do is cry, but I physically can't cry. So, I'm actively in therapy. I see a psychologist regularly, and she has helped me navigate through this a lot. I've come forward, and I consider myself a rape speaker and a consent speaker because I want to do this so other people will know that, you know, what consent actually is. Like, if you say no like 10 times and you stop speaking, you haven't given consent. Well, a house fire claimed a life in the small southern shore community of Burnt Cove yesterday. A father and son were the only people inside when their home caught fire in the morning. And while the son was able to escape, his father didn't make it out. Flames were coming out uh, from all the windows and doors by the time firefighters arrived. Heavy winds made it difficult to bring the fire under control. Firefighters were able to get inside the building by afternoon where they discovered the man's body. The RCMP from nearby Fairland were on the scene Sunday as well as the Salvation Army providing sideline support. An investigation into the cause of the fire is ongoing. It is time now to welcome Ryan back for our first look at the weather. It's very nice to see you, Ryan. Yes, and uh, thank you very much, Carolyn, for uh, back filming me for the past couple of weeks. Unfortunately, uh, my family had to say goodbye to my wonderful mother-in-law, Patricia. Uh, she's been here with us in St. John's since 2011. Um, short time, but made quite an impression uh, in that short period of time. And uh, my wife, Annie, and I... Just wanted to say a quick thank you to uh, everyone for all the love and support we received uh, from here in the community. It was uh, quite something. We're doing okay, obviously going to miss her a lot. Uh, but uh, one thing I can tell you, she loved this show, uh, especially Debbie. Uh, loved watching the weather and uh, would love this forecast. So nice to deliver a little bit of sunshine and some warmer temperatures on the way. Have a look at these current temperatures. Uh, eight degrees in Toronto, six in Ottawa right now, nine in New York, and these uh, temperatures are on the way into our neck of the woods. Check out your outlook here over the next 24 hours. Some of that warmer air really starting to push into the Maritimes tomorrow and even our neck of the woods. We're talking double digit possibilities, especially across southern New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and can't rule it across some backyards through Newfoundland and Labrador. I'll let you know where the best chance of that happening is with your complete forecast details coming up in just a few minutes. It affects your wallet and our province's future. And on Tuesday, the province is bringing down its budget and we'll be here to deliver it to you. What's cut and what's not, it's an important budget. Join us here in the lobby of the Confederation Building at 2 o'clock Island Time on Tuesday. We'll report live on Facebook and CBC Radio 1. So get your questions to us on Facebook and by using the hashtag NLBudget2018 on Twitter. That's 2 p.m. on Tuesday. We'll see you then. 
Well, the province is looking to make buying a home easier. The pre-budget announcement was made this morning in Paradise. Here are some of the details. One million dollars will be allocated for a new home purchase program. It will provide three thousand dollars in grants to go toward the down payment for newly constructed or existing new homes under four hundred thousand dollars. In total, three hundred and thirty grants will be provided this year and next. They'll go to first time home buyers who apply and qualify. The province also announced changes to its down payment assistance program that offered repayable loans for homes under $250,000. Now renamed the first time home buyers program, it will be extended to March 2019 with funding to help 100 households. And the household income threshold has been increased to $75,000 for the full benefit. Now, the announcement comes on the heels of a new housing report that shows a dramatic shift in the type of housing needs in St. John's. As here and now's Ariana Kelland reports, a slowing housing market isn't necessarily a bad thing. 2012, the back end of a spectacular housing market in St. John's. Home prices were high, driven by big oil and a thriving economy, but it wasn't built to last. Housing starts are down, uh, average prices are down around 10%, depending on location and house type, but on, on average about 10%. Uh, new home construction or housing starts are down about 60% from their peak in 2012. It sounds gloomy, but a new report shows this shift has opened up opportunities for people who couldn't afford home ownership during the boom. First time home buyers, retirees and millennials are now opting for more and more multiple unit homes. They typically go for under $300,000 and were options that weren't available during the height of the housing boom. It's worked out for some builders who are nimble enough to shift gears quickly to meet a growing need. Gibraltar Development is one company that's catering to the lower price point. We are halfway through a project, it's 41 homes and we have over half of them pre-sold. So uh, they say the market is slow out there, but in that particular price point has been going very, very well for us. But not all builders have seen the same success. It's a little bit more difficult sometimes for uh, a small builder or a, a, a developer that have lots or infrastructure already in the ground to be able to change uh, and adapt quicker. Some builders have gone out of business. Others have moved into renovations. The government's promise of opening up the housing market to more buyers is seen as a double win. There's a great deal of employment provided through new home construction. Uh, so it not only boosts the new home uh, market, but it also will provide a stimulus for, for employment in that market as well. And builders are already taking advantage, with Gibraltar Homes saying this afternoon that it will match the government's $3,000 new home program grant making the best of a market that doesn't appear to be moving anytime soon. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, Mount Pearl. She's long been a champion in the hearts of many Canadians. Now, Caitlin Osmond has a world championship under her belt. She'll have even more to celebrate with her family, friends and fans here at home next month. Osmond, of course, won the World Figure Skating Championships in Italy Friday night. <laughs> This is it, the moment 22-year-old Caitlin Osmond finished her world championship winning performance. The Marystown native wowed people with a near-perfect skate of her black swan routine, despite going on the ice Friday in fourth place, making her the first Canadian female world champ in 45 years. And her championship comes fresh off, earning a bronze medal at the Olympics, soaring back from an injury just three years ago. It was so unbelievable. I was not expecting that, especially being in fourth after the short program. I just wanted to skate a, a clean lung program and put as much of a fight in as I could to hit the podium. Um, being able to win, it shocked me so much, um, but it was so exciting. And it will be great to see Caitlin when she visits the province next month. I'll have an interview with the world champ on April 13th at Confederation Building and then head to Marystown on Saturday the 14th with our CBC crew to be a part of the big celebrations planned for Caitlin.
Well, still with sports, fresh off a star making performance at the 2018 Paralympic Games, Liam Hickey received a hero's welcome in his hometown over the weekend. Fans and supporters led a motorcade and held a meet and greet to celebrate the 20 year old's accomplishments on Saturday in paradise. It's special just to see everybody and the small kids coming up to me and stuff. So hopefully they have dreams and want to do something like this too. So yeah, it's pretty cool. What I've said to Liam since he was a little kid is, you know, every time you do this stuff, you're changing people's minds about what people are capable of, people with disabilities who want to play sport. And then when you see these sports, they're elite athletes. I mean, that, that's what I think one of the guys, one of the commentators said it best. He said, these are athletes who have a disability. They're not disabled athletes. And I think that that's the way we'd like people to look at. And we love seeing Liam be an ambassador for Parasport. You know, he, he just loves what he does. He's so passionate. He's competitive. And so for him, it's not a chore, it's not a job, it's his life. Just do what you love, and whether it's sports, music, art, whatever it may be, I think if, if you have that passion for it, it makes it easy to work, work as hard as you need to at it. So coming from Newfoundland, I mean, I think I learned at a young age that it takes a bit more maybe to, to get the attention of, of higher levels. Um, and I think just it's easy to do if you love it. What a fine young man. Absolutely. <laughs> well, still with sports, the brooms are packed and Team Guju is ready for Las Vegas. Yes, the Men's World Curling Championship gets underway this Saturday and the boys from the Valley Haley Curling Club are looking to defend their title. Today the team was on the ice for a last minute practice. Here now is Zach Gowdy spoke with them between throwing some rocks. You know, it's, it's been a whirlwind couple of weeks, but, um, you know, we've only been home for, uh, for a week and, and we leave in a couple days to go to the world. How different is it winning a world championship to defending one? I think it's the same. To be honest, uh, it's a big event for us. It's the biggest event every year, uh, with the exception of every four years in the Olympics. Um, so it's the one that everybody wants to win. And, uh, just because we won it last year doesn't have any implications on this year. So, you know, the only benefit that we have is we know we can do it. You guys have had so many big seasons, but try to put this year in context of, of your careers. Oh man, uh, tough to compare last year's win here, obviously, uh, but you know, repeating as Briar champions and getting a chance to go back to defend a world championship is something that's pretty amazing. And it's, uh, we're pretty focused and we want to make sure that we, we do the best job possible. The international field's get, kind of getting tougher each year, getting a little bit deeper. So it's going to be a long week, but um, you know the goal is just to get into in the playoffs and uh, put yourself in a good spot there. You go back even 20 years, and, and Canada would go to a World Championship, and they'd be the heavy, heavy favorite, and you know they expected to win. And, and I think now you're seeing that you know the other teams can beat you if, if you don't don't play well, and uh, you know you're, we're not going in as expected to win anymore. You got to go, and you got to play well. You talk about again the, the broader arc of your careers. You know, just compare the, the the long climb to be at the top of the position where you now sort of find yourself where you're you're having to maintain that lead and having to maintain your position. Well, I think we have a little bit of experience because when we won back in 2006, we were at the peak and and we didn't stay there very long. So I, I think that we learned from that and, and learned what we had to do uh, to to stay up there. Uh, so this time around, I think we're better prepared. I think obviously uh, we're a little bit older, more mature. I think we have a you know a more complete team as well. Um, so it's made it a little bit easier to stay at the top, but it's fun. It's fun playing well. It's uh, you know the performance we had at the Briar was was a lot of fun to be a part of and, and pretty special. So hopefully we can replicate that in, in Las Vegas next week. Carolyn, wouldn't it be great for them to cap off the season with a world championship? Oh, it would. <laughs> so much success in sports. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Really sad, sad news. It, it's disappointing for sure, but um, in many ways, not entirely unexpected. More reaction to the drop in cod stocks.
welcome back. The cod fishery has suffered another blow with the release of the latest stock survey showing a population decline of 30 percent. Marine Institute research scientist Sherry Lynn Rowe says even though there had been a small improvement in the stock in recent years, this turn for the worse was predictable, and she is urging a cautious approach to harvesting. She spoke with Jane Aidy, host of the broadcast, earlier today. It's really sad, sad news. It, it's disappointing for sure, but um, in many ways, not entirely unexpected. I am certainly of the opinion that we ramped this fishery up too, too quickly. Um, I would have preferred to have seen uh, a management plan for 2017 and, and also 2016 to a, to a lesser extent that allowed more room for continued stock growth and, and maybe didn't take quite the risky chances that we did this past time around. Last year we, uh, we published a paper in the, uh, in the scientific journal Nature um, urging the Canadian government to proceed carefully um, it, with respect to the northern cod fishery, we cautioned them not to ramp up fishing pressure too quickly because we were concerned that uh, it would in fact derail the recovery. There was evidence even 12 months ago that um, the burst of productivity that had really fueled the, the recent comeback in northern cod had likely um, slowed. Based on the, the changes that we've seen in the ecosystem over the last uh, couple of years, um, there's plenty of reason to suspect that northern cod um, natural mortality might have increased and in the assessment model natural mortality is basically a catch-all term that includes things like predation, starvation, disease, um, all factors that might have likely increased over the past year or so in response to, to changes that we've seen in the ecosystem, particularly reduced abundance of, uh, of capelin, one of cod's key prey items, as well as reduced abundance of, of shrimp, which is also another food order important food item for cod. Um, so, you know, to a, to a large extent, seeing a, a large increase in natural mortality at this time um, was entirely to be expected. The changes that we've seen in, in capelin abundance in particular have likely had a, a negative impact on cod, but uh, at the recent assessment meeting, and as we've heard many times in the past, um, a lot of harvesters are asking about potential impacts of things like, like seals. This is a stock that's, that's well within the critical zo zone. It's uh, beneath what we call the, the limit reference point, and it's well below historical um, normal levels of abundance, typically what we'd see in the 1980s as an example. And uh, when a stock gets, gets reduced to that level, we have to be really careful about uh, how we proceed and, and try not to do further harm. Once a stock reaches this point, the thought is that um, it's already suffered irreparable harm and we have to do everything in our ability to, uh, to help promote stock growth. Now that the assessment is, is done, in the coming weeks there will be a consultation between DFO Fisheries Management and, and the fishing industry to get their perspectives on uh, how they feel we should proceed. And I'm, I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions about um, how we did things last year and, and how we might best proceed moving forward. For me, I would absolutely 100% like to see a management plan that um, is maybe more conservation minded than it was last year, more precautionary in the approach and um, it doesn't stand to jeopardize long-term stock recovery and our possibility of having a, a fully rebuilt fishery to the extent that, uh, that we did last year. In terms of what we can expect for, for 2019, all of the scenarios examined at the recent assessment suggested that over the next 12 months, the stock is likely to continue to, to decline. So it's really not good news at all. He might not look like Johnny Cash, but he certainly sounds like Johnny Cash. The story of this local music, musical impressionist is next.
welcome back once again. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it a gorgeous day oh, today? It was so chilly, nice. but the sun, oh, just what we wanted. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, the sun took care of uh, any of that uh, early morning frost, and it was a frosty one in some parts of the province. Minus 27 in Badger this morning. Oh, my. Up Ouch. to plus three this afternoon. That's a huge wow. temperature contrast. Obviously, the spring sun helps this time of year. Wanted to share this picture to start things off. That is half of a snowflake sitting on a car vehicle just before the sun rose this morning and, of course, took care of that uh, good and proper. Now, that picture, uh, I want to make sure that I, I do give a shout-out uh, to... Uh, whoever posted that on my Facebook page, and I've got it here. Uh, it is uh, Vardy Gidge, and thanks very much, Vardy, uh, for sharing that wonderful picture uh, with us this evening. Now, I did mention minus 27 was the actual over uh, morning low in Badger. Uh, this was around 6 a.m. this morning, and have a look where temperatures have been headed since then. What a rebound and actually four degrees the high uh, and the temperature right now in Badger. And this is just getting started in terms of that warm up. More warm temps on the way for tomorrow. Happy Valley Goose Bay at five right now as we back things out. A uh, bit of a front moving into Labrador West right now. Area of high pressure helping to direct some of that warm air into our neck of the woods. And that low you saw off to the south there, that is on the way in, but not until we move into the Wednesday, Thursday time period with a bit of freezing rain and rain. Here's how it all plays out. Note the winds fairly light as well. So uh, typically, you know, this time of year we get a nice spring day, but the wind is really uh, rifling in from the south. That will not be the case tomorrow. We will certainly have another cool start, mainly clear skies, temperatures ranging from minus 6 to minus 14 for inland areas of central parts of Newfoundland, and a pretty cool one in Labrador to start as well, minus 4 to minus 8 generally. Note the cloud cover a little more dominant across Labrador tomorrow uh, with a mix of sun and cloud. Labrador City, a few uh, flurries not out of the question. Newfoundland, very, very nice, lots of sun. Bit of high cloud cover starting to build up into the afternoon for the Avalon Peninsula down towards the Buren. Uh, winds are going to be coming a little bit uh, stronger into the afternoon. That'll keep places uh, in that east southeast wind like Fairyland with an onshore wind near four degrees. If you're heading out for a drive to Cape Spear tomorrow, it's going to be much cooler with that onshore wind than it will be, say, uh, in places like Mount Pearl and down towards uh, inland areas of St. John Central near 8 degrees. Uh, temperatures generally across the board ranging from 6 to 8 degrees for inland areas and a little bit cooler, again, in those onshore winds towards the south as winds will be generally light, but sea breezes will be an impact for tomorrow as they are this time of year. Temperatures Pretty nice along the coast of Labrador, even around plus one for Nain. And again, increasing clouds and wouldn't rule out a late day flurry for Labrador City. Now, as we move into the Wednesday time period, you'll note around 8 a.m., uh, 6 to 8 a.m. on Wednesday morning, starting to get into that freezing rain potential. Temperatures will rise, but it will take some time. And I think freezing rain, a little bit more of an issue than what this forecast model is showing. It does become a little more spotty into the afternoon as temperatures rise, and we will see uh, some snow even mixing in for places like the Northern Peninsula. Highs on Wednesday will only be topping out in that two to three degree range for most, maybe even a little bit cooler for uh, central parts of Newfoundland. And we are going to be seeing around four degrees with a bit of bonus spring sunshine before the cloud cover builds in to southeastern Labrador. We'll talk about your long range details right through the Easter weekend coming up. Debbie. Thanks, Ryan. Well, he's only 23, but he transforms himself into musical legends many times his age. Justin Martin from Flat Rock morphs into legends like Buddy Holly, Willie Nelson, and Elvis Presley. Martin says he finds it easy to switch from one icon to the next, but we'll let you be the judge. Here now is Colleen Connors met up with Martin when his provincial tour stopped in Cornerbrook. I went down, down, down in the flames, I went higher. Anything you want, you got it. Anything you need, you got it. Why can't I free your doubt from mine? It melts your cool, cool heart. It's a little... What I find with a lot of these singers, they're so distinctive with their voices, which is what kind of sits in me, you know, like I, I can hear their little, I don't know what you call it, like techniques and, and different tones, you know. 
I find it fairly easy. Like I won't get too much into like the uh, the character, like in the mannerisms and stuff. More or less, try to get a bit of an accent for it. Go out like because if I try to get too much into it, it takes a bit more time, and and I can kind of get mixed up then and go out and think that I'm somebody else or something. Thank you so much. It's very brief, I'll go back and I'll put on a suit and a lot of times a suit gives me this feeling, you know, like this is who I am right now, you know, like when I put on the Elvis suit, it's, it's kind of empowering really, like you, you go out on stage and you feel like, you know, when they see the Elvis suit, they're like, that's Elvis. And, and you feel like, you know, that's what you got to do, you got to give me Elvis. I mean, the band really makes it, you know, makes it easy for me to do that because once they hit that, it, whatever sound they hit, it's always perfect. Like it's just like the record, and, and it puts me right into that mindset. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hope you enjoy your night now. Thank you. That's really good. He is yeah. excellent. And Justin Martin is on stage in Carboneer tonight and uh, Labrador City on Friday night. Alan Hocko is here talking about the season finale of Caught. Stay with us. Tonight is the fifth and final episode of Caught on CBC Television starring Alan Hocko. The drama is based on the novel of the same name by award-winning Newfoundland author Lisa Moore. The series follows Hocko's character who's looking for revenge after a drug deal gone wrong. He spent five years in jail while his partner went free. Caught is set in the 1970s, complete with long hair, a period soundtrack, and lighting, and a whole lot of cigarette smoking. And Alan Hocko is joining me now. So nice to uh, 
to have you here. It's, it's lovely to be here with you always, <laughs> always. Okay, a lot of tension built up over the previous four shows. Mm -hmm. What can we expect tonight? Well, uh, the, the whole mission of, of this show for me was uh, I saw from the very beginning that I thought this could be a long-running show. So the first, ep the first season's five episodes, uh, and, and a lot gets resolved tonight, but there's, um, there's a lot of unexpected things that happen. I don't know how to kind of tease it up, but... <laughs> so are you saying you know there's a second season at this point? Has that been given the green light? No, I wish I could say that. Uh, I wish I had that power <laughs> to do it. It is greenlit to no, uh, but everyone's excited. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, CBC has been uh, insanely supportive right from the get-go with the whole marketing plan, like how cool the posters are and how mm -hmm. the, their social media campaign, um, everything. Um, we're excited about it and we're working on it, but uh, there's no official green light, but there's definitely a plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. This has been well received. Uh, the reviews have been uh, very favorable. I was reading one critic who said, you put aside Jake Doyle's cockiness and play a convincing and vulnerable ex-con. How hard did you have to work at it to leave Jake Doyle behind? It's always challenging, you know, when you play any character for any extended period of time to not let those uh, mannerisms seep in. And Jake and I became very, uh, <laughs> very in one-on-one. -on -one. The fantasy line was blurred, was it? <laughs> well, physically and uh, the hair, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but So I worked real hard to yeah. make sure, and I do with every part. When Republic of Doyle ended, I did a bunch of movies and I did a lot of things and I went right back to school as an actor to kind of retrain myself to... Really? Yeah, it was a lot. Uh, I worked with people, with coaches, and I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't a one-trick pony when I had never been a one-trick pony before Republica Doyle, but I wanted to be better. Like, we never, we never can stop trying to be better. So I continue. That's my mission forever. <laughs> you, don't stop. you are still working on Frontier. I understand you were in the UK to yep. put some finishing touches. Is that the end of shooting for you from yep. that? We're officially wrapped season three. Mm -hmm. So I didn't shoot in the UK. I shot in Ottawa, but I went to the UK. There was like a splinter... We call it a rogue unit, which uh, with a select amount of our crew, and uh, a bunch of Jason Momoa stuff. And I was there as producer to lend a hand. So I know you seem to be constantly uh, in high gear. Anything you can tell us about coming up? We're developing another season of COT, so that's re that's a real thing. And uh, Perry Chafe and I started working on that with one of our other writers, John Krasank, who started you know uh, adapting the show with me from the get go. I've managed to convince Adriana Mags to come back and Julia Cohen, so the whole team for the first season. We're going to assemble as soon as everybody gets a bit of time and to start working on that. And Take the Shot is always constantly trying to keep making shows. So that's your a, production company. That's right, yeah. 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 Well, we will look forward to the uh, season finale tonight and whatever else comes your way. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. Thank you for having me on tonight. Thank you. CBC Feed and L presents Tasty Tunes with local musicians and chefs, a songwriter circle and small plates in support of the Community Food Sharing Association. Visit cbc.ca slash nl for all the deets.
Welcome back once again. It's time to meet our young athlete of the day. This is Mitchell Gillingham, nine years old, from the Lewisport area. He's a big hockey fan and has a lot of fun playing with the Lewisport Seahawks. Way to go, Mitchell. You're today's young athlete of the day. The weather update is brought to you by Belltone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. Looking forward to getting a first look at the weekend. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, starting off with, though, uh, say cheese, a picture from above. And this, uh, you know, it's been a while since we had a clear day mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. across the province. We'll get another one tomorrow on another good view. But uh, from NASA's MODIS satellite. So this is a high resolution satellite picture that's taken, uh, again, from wow. NASA. And so much detail here. Uh, you can actually try and find this online if you uh, punch it into Dr. Google. Uh, and a couple things to note. Look at all that pack ice uh, rolling down the north co or the coast of Labrador and then really packed in, uh, of course, to northern Newfoundland thanks to those northerlies a few weeks ago. A couple other noticeable features here. Note the snow cover, widespread for most of Newfoundland. But note the, the very southern part of the Buren Peninsula and the southern Avalon now becoming uh, almost snow free. So uh, a little bit of progress here <laughs> over the last uh, couple of weeks as uh, spring tries to uh, move into Newfoundland and Labrador. The satellite uh, picture in terms of the weather, you can see where this is a feature that's rolling into Labrador right now. Increasing cloud cover, a couple of flurries possible with that tonight through tomorrow, but overall it's just dominant clouds. We've got this area of high pressure in firm control for now. This low brewing off to the south is eventually going to break things down here. and We're going to be seeing that rain spread in and a little bit of freezing rain uh, mixing in with that as well. So we're going to keep an eye on the timing of this one. Uh, note as we roll through tomorrow, high pressure in firm control and that high uh, cloud cover will start to build in into the afternoon. You'll see those high cirrus clouds first and then uh, slowly but surely that cloud will uh, sink closer to the surface as we roll through Tuesday night and into Wednesday. It looks like the arrival time will be Wednesday morning and with temperatures near freezing, I am expecting that some freezing rain may be an issue for the drive to work on Wednesday morning and then lingering even into the afternoon for places like central Newfoundland, uh, western parts of Newfoundland. Uh, the northern peninsula will see likely a wet snow mix while the rest of the island will warm up and see just shower for Tuesday, uh, Wednesday afternoon and Wednesday evening rather. Labrador stays pretty quiet and then gets into some snow potential for Wednesday night into Thursday. A uh, few wet flurries mixing back in for western Newfoundland on Thursday, but I think Thursday's forecast for central and eastern Newfoundland is generally some showers. Now the all-important weekend forecast and a lot of folks traveling and as we look at that Thursday forecast, there are those shower chances, central and west. It looks like a bit of a break for early Friday, good Friday into Saturday. Uh, keeping an eye on a possible system, but uh, forecast models kind of back and forth on that. But we do have a secondary low that looks like it will work in later Saturday and into Sunday. And that looks like it'll have rain, possibly some uh, accumulating snow for western and, uh, and uh, uh, the northern peninsula. And then, of course, southeastern parts of Labrador. I will say... Uh, that uh, even for a Monday forecast, still some considerable uncertainty with this, this weekend setup and exactly the timing of those lows. So you're going to want to stay tuned. Uh, definitely better agreement in the setup that tomorrow's a beauty. A bit of mixing over to some rain showers for Wednesday and into Thursday. And then Friday looks like a pretty good day. And then keeping an eye again on that Saturday, Sunday timing in that system. But warm temps, uh, mild, let's say mild temps for this time of year. Certainly in the 6, 7, 8 degree range for the east as we roll through the Friday, Saturday, Sunday t uh, time period. Uh, for Labrador, again, pretty mild uh, certainly for Tuesday. And then the temperatures back closer to the seasonal mark. And we are watching the potential for some snow for the weekend uh, for you folks in uh, eastern Labrador as well. That's your forecast to now. Debbie. Thanks, Ryan. In national and international news, the federal government is moving to make it easier for family doctors to treat opioid addiction by cutting red tape. Health Minister Jeanette Petipa-Taylor introduced the changes today in Ottawa. We know way too many parents, sisters, brothers, daughters, sons, or loved ones have died because of opioids. 
Just in 2016, there were over 2,900 deaths. Taylor is loosening restrictions on who can prescribe methadone and similar drugs. The changes will make prescription heroin available for the very first time outside of hospital settings. The hope is that will encourage community-based treatment where it's most needed. Well, shopping malls across Russia were ordered to conduct urgent safety checks today in the wake of that horrific mall fire in Siberia. At least 64 people died, many of them children, when smoke and flames suddenly engulfed the entertainment complex in the city of Kemerova. Investigators say the building was rife with safety violations and they've detained four people for questioning. As Chris Brown reports, many of the victims never stood a chance. Well, the city of Kamerova, in fact, all of Russia is really grieving today over the tragedy that's unfolded at the Winter Cherry Mall outside of the, uh, of the stricken facility. Lots of flowers, lots of people coming just really to uh, try to absorb the enormity of the uh, scores of people who died inside and, and some of the stories and images that uh, we've seen through social media um, in the last 24 hours. Investigators inside are leveling some pretty serious accusations. They're saying that a number of the exits were blocked and in fact that a security guard for some unknown reason uh, turned off the fire alarm. We don't know if it was turned off when it went or if it was turned off before any of this began, but um, they're definitely saying there were some very serious safety violations. We're learning a little bit more about some of the people that uh, we, we've sort of come to know, if you will, by their actions. Um, some of the most dramatic video involved people trying to escape uh, from the mall. One was an 11 year old boy who was seen uh, forced out a window, clinging to a windowsill four stories up with the flames all around him. Well, uh, he fell to the ground, hit an awning, uh, but we do know that he's still alive. He managed to survive that. His name is Sergei Moskalenko. He's 11 years old, but tragically, everyone else in his family, his mother, his father, uh, and also uh, a sibling also died in that. We're also seeing some uh, social media uh, posts that are uh, coming up from some of the young people that were inside the cinema when this uh, fire happened. A lot of them obviously saw uh, how terrifying it was. They picked their phones up and they started to call and send uh, messages to their loved ones. One girl, Victoria Pacharenko, who was just 12 years old, uh, said to her aunt, the doors are locked, we can't get out. Please tell mom I loved her. Uh, and we're seeing so many of these just heartbreaking stories today. Also stories about people who tried to break their way out through locked doors and stairwells with flames around them. Um, and in some of these cases, we just don't know what happened to them. The fire apparently started back up again earlier today because the part of the roof collapsed. And so authorities say for the moment, their job remains trying to get at um, any victims that may still be inside the mall and then also trying to identify uh, who they all were. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Well, in the years before Canadian Confederation, six Indigenous leaders were convicted and hanged for murder in the deaths of 14 white road builders in the central western B.C. interior. Well, today, the names of those six chiefs were cleared in a declaration from the Prime Minister in the House of Commons. An important symbol of our commitment to reconciliation. We confirm without reservation that Chief Klatasine Chief Biyil, Chief Telad, Chief Takot, Chief Chasis, and Chief Aoun are The Chilcotin uh, chiefs, community members and drummers were on hand for today's apology and exoneration statement. The Chilcotin have always objected to the treatment of their chiefs as criminals, they argued, and the prime minister acknowledged when the conflict occurred, the Chilcotin were at war with colonial powers in defense of their territory. In 2014, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled title to the land did indeed rest with the Chilcotin. The B.C. government exonerated the executed chiefs shortly after that ruling. Our viewer picture of the day. A couple of uh, clues in here. One, the topography is uh, pretty unique, and this is a 
one of, if not the most beautiful spot uh, in the province, and a couple of clues on the maps, too. Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Still, the picture was uh, too good uh, to uh, pass up, and uh, we will uh, show it to you again and let you know who sent it in coming up after so the So beautiful, Ryan. Welcome back to Here and Now. And now for your daily dose of awe. <laughs> Dozens of puppies took to the park this past weekend for a pug grumble. <laughs> Hugs, bugs, chugs, puggles and muggles <laughs> were all welcome. There was lots of snorting, rolling, running and grumbling. Appropriately, a group of pugs is called a grumble. Ooh, I didn't did know that. I did not know that either. Mm. The Pug Puppy Playdate is a monthly event in Toronto. Uh, there will be another pug meet up in April. <laughs> yeah. The dogs were all well marked because they look somewhat <laughs> similar. <laughs> they do. Beautiful weather there. Isn't that gorgeous? <laughs> yeah, a little taste of uh, what's on the way for us with a little bit of sunshine, some warmer temperatures, a beautiful day, obviously, in uh, southern Ontario uh, the last couple of days. And uh, our weather picture of the day, also a beautiful one. In case you uh, didn't get it, well, you should be studying <laughs> a little harder, I think. Uh, but uh, this beautiful picture comes to us from Gross Morn. Snowmobile season, of course, is coming to an end, uh, unfortunately, for those folks that love it so much. And Linda shared this on my Facebook page. Uh, one last snowmobile ride, uh, perhaps for her, and you know, for the for others. I think in the backcountry, certainly you'll still get a few more weeks. But uh, I've never had the pleasure of being over there at this time of the year, and I understand because here in the east we didn't have very much snow at all this winter. A lot of people headed to the west coast. A lot, I bet you, many were enjoying that view. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, and it was a pretty good winter out there. Uh, they had. Uh, Lots of snow, some warm-ups, but uh, I think that was good because then the snow wasn't at least over the rooftops there, so, yeah. Nice. That's it for us. Nice to have you back, Ryan. Nice to be back. Thank you very much. And uh, Carol and I will be together for a couple of weeks. Anthony is taking a bit of R&R, &R, and we'll see you tomorrow. Budget day. Yes. <laughs> good night. Good night.